Can I just begin the evening by welcoming you all to this evening's inaugural lecture? It's a real pleasure to see you here and to welcome not just uh, academic colleagues from the university, but also students, members of Carolyn's family, and also professional colleagues from the, the, the wider health, uh, health economy. Um, the, one of the purposes of an inaugural lecture is clearly to give our uh, new professor the opportunity to talk about their area of expertise and their, their routes to becoming a, a chair. But it's also a chance for us to showcase some of the thinking, some of the ideas, some of the research which are very much making Keele University one of the leading research universities, particularly in the area of, of health that we're focused on tonight. <laughs> um, it is an important occasion, and I hope that you will enjoy the event enormously. Um, Carolyn is a graduate of the University of Manchester, and she completed her GP training in the North West, and she's been a GP principal in central Manchester for now for over 20 years and is very much committed to the role of the GP and to providing high-quality, patient-centred care. But she's also followed alongside that a very distinguished academic pathway, and she was appointed to a post of senior lecturer in 2009 at the University of Manchester, and a personal chair uh, shortly after that. And then in 2012, uh, she moved here to Keele University as our Professor of General Practice Research. Um, Carolyn is a qualitative researcher, and she draws very much on theories from both the social sciences and psychology to inform thinking about practice within the health arenas. But she draws those together with very much a focus on enhancing and improving clinical practice. And her main area of interest and expertise focuses on the management of patients with difficult-to-understand symptoms in the primary care consultation. And she's contributed to the evidence base on the management of mental health problems in primary care. A particular interest of hers is the doctor-patient relationship and how distress in that relationship is recognised and dealt with in that interaction. Um, she's published very extensively. She's held a number of senior roles within the broader um, health profession. So we're delighted to welcome Carolyn as, as a member of the uh, senior academic te team here at Keel. So tonight's lecture is going to follow Carolyn's research career, and it's going to highlight some of the salient publications and reporting perspectives on the doctor-patient interaction. And she's going to illustrate the value of qualitative research methods in capturing the richness of patient and practitioner experiences in receiving and delivering care. And she's also going to discuss some of those, the implications of that for education, for training, and for clinical practice. So can I therefore very warmly welcome Carolyn Chu Graham, Professor of General Practice, and invite her to present her inaugural lecture, Distress in Primary Care, Learning from Patients and Colleagues. Carolyn. Thank you very much. And actually, you've summarised what I'm going to say, so we could just finish now and go on to the food. <laughs> But I guess I'm not going to be allowed to do that. So thanks, everybody, for coming. And there is food afterwards. So I'm going to talk about who I am, not in a very sort of existential way, but about my research, what I'm doing here, what I've done so far, as Nick said. And particularly, I'm going to mention who's helped me along the way. And I'm going to finish off with outlining my ideas for my work at Keel. So I arrived here 18 months ago, um, and thank you very much for, for enabling that. But I'm going to go back to my roots, which are not too far away. So I was brought up at, in Clayton, and actually, I think I've got something magic that um, <laughs> identifies where I was brought up. And actually, this is an old map, I realise, because Keele University Medical School is still shown on the North Staff's, uh, North Staff's Royal Infirmary, or UHS. And obviously now you're located down here. Um, so I was brought up not too far away, so I have come back to my roots. And we managed to dig out a very old photograph. Um, you can tell it's old because it's going yellow around the edges, which is a bit embarrassing, and it's in black and white. Now, I, I, it's in black and white not because colour hadn't been invented, as my <laughs> son and daughter said. It's in black and white because it came from the Evening Sentinel, and it's of me as head girl, I'm the one with the flowers, holding the flowers, um, presenting to somebody who I really don't know. So if anybody's got any idea who this person is, it would be great. 
Um, I do know Mr Jenkin, who was the deputy headmaster at Clayton Hall Grammar School. And so from there, I went to Manchester University. And I'm not going to tell you what date that was, although Nick's already said that I've been a GP for over 20 years, so that gives you a bit of a clue. So I went up to Manchester University and studied medicine, qualified as a doctor. And I'm going to start mentioning people now. And the person who I think had most impact on me when I was a medical student was Professor Sir David Goldberg. He was a tutor when I was in year four in my psychiatry attachment. And he's an immense character, uh, very forceful, an excellent researcher. And he chastised GPs for not diagnosing depression in primary care. He said that GPs were, were negligent, that um, depression was going unnoticed and untreated. And he published a lot in that area, and that impacted upon me. However, more recently, David has come to realise that it's much more complex than GPs missing diagnoses, that the doctor-patient interaction means that it can be difficult for a distress to be displayed, disclosed, and for the diagnosis to be made. So I became a junior doctor, and my first house job was at Manchester Royal Infirmary, and you can see there are blue skies even in Manchester. And I remember the days in Manchester Royal Infirmary because I was one of the old school junior doctors who worked from Friday morning till Monday night, often without very much sleep. And so whilst I liked my white coat, now here's a photograph in colour. So I liked my white coat, but actually I thought I really wanted to be a GP. I wanted to invest in long-term relationships with patients. So just sidetracking a little bit, I think what underpins my both academic and clinical career is learning from the literature, thinking about how patients understand their illnesses, how they understand encounters with doctors. So Sylvia Plath wrote in The Bell Jar about how it was having depression was like being outside looking in. And William Styron talks about the self lack of self-worth and self-hate that people who are depressed can, can, can experience. And Tim Lott talked about how dried roses were the medieval treatment for melancholia or depression. And reading these accounts made me think it's actually really important to understand what people bring to the consultation, what understandings and models they have of their illness, because only then can you understand where the patient's coming from and deal with that patient in a sensible fashion, moving them forwards. So what is the consultation? Well, I like this quote from James Spence. The essential unit of medical practice is the occasion when, in the inter intimacy of the consulting room or sick room, a, patient who is Ill, a person who is ill or believes himself to be ill seeks the advice of a doctor whom he trusts. This is the consultation, and all else in the practice of medicine follows from it. And I want to just run through the consultation with Dr. Gordon from Sylvia Plath's book. I'd imagined a kind, ugly, intuitive man looking up and saying, ah, oh, in an encouraging way, as if he could see something I couldn't. And then I would find words to tell him how I was so scared as if I was being stuffed farther and farther back into a black airless sack with no way out. And he would lean back in his chair and match the tips of his fingers together in a little steeple and tell me why I couldn't sleep and why I couldn't read and why I couldn't eat and why everything people did seemed so silly because they only died in the end. And then I thought he would help me step by step, to be myself again. So Sylvia Plath describes how she was thinking about what she would expect from the consultation with a psychiatrist and how that was going to inform um, the, the, this consultation. But then she says, but Dr Gordon wasn't like that at all. He was young and good looking. And I could see right away he was conceited. So the doctor has an impact on the person who presents himself as a patient. And they impact not only on that consultation in question, but they also, it also impacts on the patient's future consulting behaviour. 
So I decided to be a GP. And this is Professor Carl Whitehouse, who was my GP trainer. He impressed me with being very kind and compassionate and empathic with the patients that he consulted. And I was very privileged to watch him consult. And I hope that I took that compassion and kindness to the consultations that I have with patients. But Carl also showed me that you could be a clini clinician and an academic, that you could bring your academic work to influence your clinical practice, and that your clinical practice could drive the research questions that you, you set out to investigate. And I trained to be a GP in Moss Side and Rush Home. So you can see the Curry Mile, you can see the 1970s Health Centre. This area was an area of high deprivation, and as a junior GP trainee, I was stunned and shocked about how helpless I felt in the face of people's problems. People presented not just by medical problems, which I was expecting, but psychological problems, which I felt ill-prepared for, and social problems, which I felt completely unable to tackle. And I, became, I came to realise as a, a GP trainee that people didn't actually present diagnoses. They didn't come in with a label. They came in with symptoms, being lonely, angry, worried. They were distressed. And I realised that people have needs and problems before they have a diagnosis. And Donald Sean is the person who David Shires introduced me to, who described quite well, I think, the, the turmoil that I was feeling as a GP trainee and the contrast between the high technical ground, as he calls it, of hospital medicine and general practice. So he says, in the varied topography of professional practice, there's a, a high, hard ground of technical rationality which overlooks a swamp where problems are messy, confusing and incapable of technical solution. The difficulty is that the problems of the high ground, however great their technical interest, are often relatively unimportant to clients or to the larger society, while in the swamp are the problems of the greatest human concern. And I began to think that GPs are actually swamp workers, that we work with people, patients who are in a swamp, and we're in the swamp with them. And this GP's got a boat, sometimes we're actually swimming in that swamp. And I felt as a GP trainee that what I wanted to do was to try and make sense of the swamp, both for patients, but also for my, my peers and my colleagues. And I want to say thank you to David, who's in the audience, for introducing me to Donald Sean and helping me make sense of general practice. Um, and thank you for coming, David. And David's the one on the right, of course. Um, and I very much appreciate the work that you did and the help that you gave me when I was clinical champion for mental health for the Royal College of General Practitioners quite a few years ago, and the help that you continue to give. And as a GP, it's really important that we get some support and help for the numerous interactions that we have in every day. And so I want to thank Ballant, Michael Ballant, who is a psychotherapist, who realised that doctors needed to talk about their interactions with patients. And I'm very pleased and grateful that I've been able to belong to a number of Balint groups to actually talk about the interactions that I have on a daily basis. Pictured on the left is the current health centre in which I work. You see, I obviously have a passion for these red brick, um, bricks on the inside, 1960s and 70s health centres. This practice is in Charlton which for those of you who know Manchester is a much more, um, or much less deprived area than Moss Side and Rush Home. But patients' problems are just as complex. People still bring things to me that I find difficult to deal with and the Ballant Group can be quite helpful. But then so can David, who's my GP partner, who's holding the fort at the practice tonight. So as a GP, I realised the consultation was important. And I decided as an academic, that's what I wanted to focus on. But I just also want to talk about how we as doctors, how we learn about managing distress in the consultation. 
and it should be at medical school. And yet, the psychiatry training that, that I had, and certainly I think that, that a lot of doctors have nowadays, still talks about syndromes that are easy to label and easy to treat. There's not much talk about swamps. In general practice, general practice training probably does offer that ability to, to talk about things that are, are more difficult, more difficult to understand. I did some work with a medical student who is now an academic trainee in surgery in London. And she was interested in, the, in why uh, people, medical students, perhaps didn't recognise that they were going to be dealing with patients who were distressed, but also that they might have distress themselves. And we found through interviewing medical students, they said, it's, it's fine, other people get distressed, we don't. But if I did, I wouldn't want to go to the medical school. They wouldn't want it on their records. So there's a lot of stigma around mental health, which I think we learn in medical school. So I've always supported, I hope, medical students. And Sarah, who's here tonight, is somebody else who's always invested a lot of time in supporting medical students through their career. And Sarah's now down at Keele, and I hope that we can work together in the future. And I wanted to mention my three mentees this year, Jenny, Shohan, and Shoba, who I don't know whether they're in the audience, but um, they were asked if they'd like to come. And at this point, I want to mention Peter Croft, who I have seen earlier. Um, and this is a slight deviation. Peter came to the Robert Derbyshire practice when I was a GP trainee and taught us all about joints and about joint injections. And I have to say, Peter, I don't do any joint injections. I'm not that sort of doctor. But you know I've always been impressed by your empathy and kindness to patients when you were a clinician and your research. And as you're aware, I watched the development of the primary care unit um, since its inception visited you in a porter cabin on the North Staff's Royal Infirmary site many years ago. Um, and I'm so proud to be part of the unit that you set up. So thank you, Peter. So moving on to my academic work. Some of you will recognize Carl May. It's not really a, a, a nice photograph, but I couldn't find a better one, so I apologize to Carl. But he was my MD supervisor. He saw, supported my development, my expertise, and qualitative research methods. He continues to be a mentor and is a really good friend of mine. So for those of you who have come for the science, there's a little bit here now. So I'm an, I have, as Nick said, an expertise in qualitative methods. And that's a, about understanding the whys and the wherefores. So it's really important to do trials that tell us whether an intervention works or doesn't work. But it's equally important to find out the reasons why that intervention, that new model of care, did or didn't work. And only when you understand that can you actually think about implementation, putting the results of a trial into practice. And qualitative methods help you do that. So quantitative techniques, which are really important, test a hypothesis and answer a specific question. But qualitative techniques explore an issue in more detail. We don't always aim to answer a question, but we focus on subjective meanings. And both are valid and both can provide evidence. And I'm going to talk about the evidence that I've provided over my career. The majority of qualitative work that I do is interviewing people. I interview people to try and find out the how and the why, what people think, feel, why they do th certain things. And when I first started interviewing, actually, we didn't even have tape recorders. We wrote notes. And that was my first qualitative study, looking at older people and the introduction in the 1990 contracts of um, health checks for over 70s. We progressed from taking notes to taking a tape, tape recorder in. And we now use digital recorders. So you go along as a researcher with your tape recorder or digital recorder and talk to a respondent, a GP or a practice nurse or a patient. And then when that interview's done, as a, as a, a doctoral student, you type your own interviews. When you get a bit older and a bit wiser and you've got some money, then somebody else types the interviews up and you get a transcript. 
And that's the data that which qualitative researchers work with, usually in teams, and looking at what that data says to try and make sense of it, to try and tell a story. And I'm going to present some of those stories. Before I do, I want to mention Chris Main, who was also my co-supervisor, my MD. And the MD was around managing people with back pain. We set up a clinic at the Robert Derbyshire practice to try a new model of care, to try whether acupuncture uh, for low back pain helped. So I've got filing cabinets, actually I should say they're locked filing cabinets full of data with the numbers, the quantitative measures. But, you know, I really wasn't interested in those numbers. But I was interested in people's stories. I was interested in patients who talked to me about consultations they'd had with their doctors that were unsatisfactory. And so I, I got permission from Carl May, um, and, and Chris Main to perhaps focus a little less on the numbers and a little bit more on interviewing patients about their experiences with back pain and interviewing GPs. So I started learning from my colleagues. And this GP talked about how he felt he was in a difficult situation managing people with back pain. He wasn't sure what the cause was. He wasn't, wasn't really sure how to manage these people. So he said, sometimes patients are not sure where the pain, whether the pain can be relieved by their doctor, so they come just for a bit of advice. Sometimes they come expecting that there should be something done for the back pain. The main thing is that if we are um, sure that there's no mechanical or obvious reason for it, then sympathy and uh, a bit of uh, reassurance. You can feel the anxiety in this GP who's telling you about dealing with people who've got back pain with no explainable cause and he doesn't know what to do. And patients were aware that doctors didn't know what to do. So the, the, the lady said, he must think, oh no, not another one with back pain. I mean, they do, don't they? And then the second data extract talks about the difficulty of getting different messages from different doctors. And he says, I don't really believe any of them know really. Do you? So I can introduce Peter Salmon, who was my MD examiner. He's a very kind, gentle, very thoughtful researcher. Again, a qualitative researcher. And he's become a mentor and more recently a colleague. And I'm going to come back to him later. And once I've got my MD sorted out of the way, I started to look back at the data that I'd collected from my thesis working with Mark Perry, who'd also done some interviews with GPs about um, prescribing for people with hepatitis C. And we looked at the data, and we thought, actually, having a GP who does, who's a researcher, it does something to the data. It influences the data that we're collecting. And we had one GP who had talked quite candidly about his experiences in managing people with back pain, saying to me, and I hope to God you're not from the Daily Mail. And we thought that actually the role of the GP as interviewer is really important. So that the GP could be perceived by the respondent as, as an interviewer, as any other re researcher. But they could be perceived by the GP respondent as a peer or a confidant, as in the, the previous data extract. But also the GP interviewer could be perceived as an expert, and that influences the sort of data that a GP respondent's going to be able to give if they think that they're talking to somebody who knows all about back pain or chronic fatigue. And also in our data, we found that, that some of the GP respondents thought they were being judged. They thought that their, uh, their practice was coming under scrutiny. And this is quite an important paper and quite highly cited because it talks to, to the role of qualitative research and the importance of the interviewer in the data that's collected. So move, I moved on from back pain to depression. And I've always tried to work with medical students to increase research capacity in primary care. And two medical students, Scott and Hannah, collected data from GPs in central Manchester around depression, what GPs thought about depression, how they manage depression. And this GP said, well, depression's the new back pain, you know. The only way out of working 
for a living is to be ill. So the GPs that we spoke to were very disparaging about people with depression. They saw it as an intractable problem. They also saw it as a label that they could, be, could conveniently place on people in order to uh, categorise them, perhaps get them out of the consultation. And this other GP says, when we feel powerless to help the patient in any other way, or we can see that they've got no other resources to turn to, depression. So GPs were saying to us that actually depression is quite a useful label to put on people. It helps us to, to end that consultation, to give the patient a label, and to give us, as GPs, a way out. Lindsay Wildman was another medical student who was very interested in unexplained symptoms. And she conceived uh, this study where she interviewed GPs about dealing with people with unexplained symptoms. These are, are symptoms that people take to the doctors, take to their GP, and, but also hospital doctors, that don't have an explainable cause. So it's not like having diabetes or hypertension. So it might be having aches all over, or extreme tiredness, or abdominal pain, irritable bowel. And these symptoms have occupied quite a lot of my working life as a GP, but also as an academic. And Lindsay talked to GPs about how they felt about managing people with unexplained symptoms. So the top GP said, some make your stomach churn when they come in, very nervous. They make it very clear that they're taking charge, and they do, they take charge, and there's nothing you can do. So this GP was really quite fearful of having to deal with people where he couldn't put a label on. And the GP at the bottom uh, gave a very candid account, very frustrating. You can get yourself into the position where you will never spot an illness in this patient if it was staring you in the face because you feel it's just their bloody somatizing. And Lindsay was very moved by the data that she collected. It was very rich data. And the, the GPs who spoke to her as a medical student were incredibly honest in their accounts. Pictured is Martin Rowland, who's now Professor of General Practice down in Cambridge. But he allowed myself and Carl May to do some secondary analysis that was completely unfunded. But we looked at a number of different data sets that we had. And we suggested that People with unexplained symptoms or depression or back pain often present to their GP with intract in seemingly intractable problems. GPs don't know what to do. They find the patient's problems difficult to challenge. We felt that there was quite a lot of collusion going on in the consultation. GPs talked about the need to preserve the doctor-patient relationship, but by preserving the doctor-patient relationship, they felt that they couldn't move the patient forward. So doctors were describing to us how they felt powerless to intervene. And the problem and the patient remains intractable. And we did some further work where we described the concept of disposable, disposal of patients. And by disposal, I don't mean the co-op undertakers across the road. I mean how to get the patient out of the cons consulting room. <laughs> We found that the doctor's capacity for empathy is associated with their ability to actually do something with the patient or for the patient. So if you can put a label on, if you can prescribe, if you can refer, that makes that consultation relatively easy, satisfying for both patient and GP. But when there isn't an easy answer, there's not an easy response, the consultation and preserving the doctor-patient relationship becomes the focus for the GP. And the doctor becomes frustrated, and both doctor and patient uh, feel that this is a, a chronic, ongoing problem and relationship that's not getting anywhere. So that's all rather pessimistic, and I think that, that was how I felt in the, the mid-2000s about, goodness me, what am I doing in general practice? How frustrating GPs are, how fed up patients are. And then I started to work with Simon Coxage, who is a GP in Chapel on the Frith. He's a senior lecturer in Manchester, and he's also a vicar. So that just gives you some idea of his perspective. But we did some work, again, with medical students collecting data, where we explored the concept of holding. Now, holding is defined as a doctor-patient relationship that's established and trusting, 
and confident and reliable. And it's concerned with ongoing support. But rather than, as in my earlier work, where I talked about collusion and lack of progress and chronicity, we thought that this could be a positive thing. And so we talked to GPs who identified themselves as understanding what holding might, might be, and we talked to their patients who'd got long-term conditions. And we, felt that, we found that GPs and patients thought that holding relationships, routine consultations with people with intractable problems, were a legitimate part of general practice, an important part, and were actually valued by patients and practitioners alike. So much more positive. And we did some further work about the use of touch in the consultation with two different medical students. And we highlighted how patients valued touch, they valued the physical contact, particularly in situations that were distressing, and that GPs felt that it was a legitimate thing to do. And we talked to the GPs about, have you had any training in this? And their response was no, and I don't know whether it's right to do it. And so we've managed to influence the communication skills teaching at Manchester Medical School to include a session on the use of touch in the consultation. So if there's anyone here from Keele Communications Teaching, then I'd love to talk to you about it. And learning from older people. Heather, I'm sorry to put you on with the title of older people, but <laughs> Heather's a research fellow here at Keele um, and joined a team about nine or ten years ago in Manchester where we just got some funding to investigate a new model of care to manage depression in older people. And I'm not going to talk much about the trial. Um, I'm going to say thank you to Steve for being an important part of the study. Um, but I'm going to talk about the qualitative work that we did within that trial, talking to GPs and older people about depression. And actually, older people didn't name depression. They didn't talk about depression. They talked about life. They talked about things that had happened to them, about loss, bereavement. And this lady talked about the robbery. And the way it was, my worries, the things that had happened last year, the do with me back and my leg, then the robbery. You know, as I say, it's not me for six kind of thing. So again, you can hear the distress in people's voices, but they're not conceptualising it as depression, as a medical problem, as something that warrants the doctor's attention. When we talked to GPs and nurses about how they viewed depression in older people, and this GP says, well, I just wonder whether we're medicalising their discontent. GPs and nurses felt that it was justifiable for older people to be depressed because of their losses, because of their um, medical comorbidity. And this community nurse said, sometimes I think people are depressed because that's where their life is at the time. I think there's almost an acceptance that it's justifiable depression. There, there are reasons for it. And people went on to say, why bother treating? So there's a therapeutic nihilism, we suggest, that older people are not thought to be um, warranting of treatment for their depressive illness. And the GPs and nurses said, well, there's no point looking for depression in old people because I can't do much about it. And so I've done quite a lot of work on depression in older people and worked with Alistair Burns and Robert Baldwin in Manchester. We published a book and an editorial in the BMJ. And that was t 10 years ago, 2004. And I have to say that I think clinically we're not much further on with managing depression in older people. But I'm still trying. And I'm working with Simon Gilbody in York to um, do a trial of... Um, Collaborative care for depression in older people. This is Simon. I was at a conference last week and um, somebody presented a picture of the Round Trees gum boy and put it side by side with Simon's picture. And I have to say that they're rather similar. Um, but Simon's not impressed. <coughs> so another person that I need to thank for being here today is Linda Gask, who I've worked with for over 20 years. And she's done a lot of work in trying to train GPs to detect depression in older people, manage de depression in people, and look at how un people with unexplained symptoms can be better managed. 
And she firmly believes that depression is a long-term condition, that doctors need to be proactive, offer long-term support. And Chris Dowrick takes a slightly different view, and I do recommend reading his book, Beyond Depression. So he talks about depression being life, and perhaps thinking of a more social response to depression rather than going down a biomedical route. But together, we've just completed a big programme of work, and it's an enormous team, called the AMP Project. And again, I'm just going to highlight some of the qualitative work that we did in the AMP Project. And again, we spoke to people from underserved groups who had self-reported as having distress. And they talked about it in models and metaphors. They, again, didn't use the word depression. So this asylum seeker says, it's life, not illness. It's, it was the war. When we were fleeing, we suffered a lot. Because I didn't have pain like this before. And then there were members of my family that were killed as well. There's an underlying nervousness. Yes, I have stomach ache, and my body trembles, and I'm exhausted. So we might look at this and say, oh, this person's got anxiety. But that's too easy a label to apply. And then this homeless person talks about the double stigma. There's a stigma having a mental health problem, but if you're also one of these underserved groups, a homeless person, it's like we've got two heads, like we're all drunk, drunks and junkies. So if you're going to develop any intervention around depression in people from these underserved groups, you've got to recognise the metaphors that people actually work with. And what we did in the AMP programme was consider that there are three aspects to any care or any intervention that you need to develop. So yes, you need to develop a psychosocial intervention to treat the depression. Yes, you need to improve primary care quality, but we feel that community engagement is really important. We should be referring people to what's out there already in the community. Age UK, um, Beth Johnson Foundation around here, lunch clubs, church groups. They're really important sources of help for people that we just don't use as GPs. And our AMP project is fed into the NICE guidelines. And, and I'm very proud of the depression guideline because we actually had a whole chapter on qualitative work around depression. And that for NICE was quite a, a breakthrough. So I've already mentioned unexplained symptoms, and this is Sarah Peters, who I've worked with quite a lot over the past 10 years. And we did some work around uh, interviewing patients who've got chronic fatigue, and I just want to read this extract to you to illustrate the sorts of stories that patients with chronic fatigue syndrome told us about their interactions with doctors. He frightened me to the degree that if you went in and you said something and you didn't like it, and he is the doctor, he would snap at you. I was extremely tired and struggling, and he just, he just didn't take me seriously. He appeared very distracted, not interested. He could get quite nasty if you tried to pursue things, if you tried to go over a point of how you felt. I did try, and he would just turn around and, you know, stop, snap at me and make me feel as though it was all in my mind. So people with unexplained symptoms were describing the distress of their symptoms, but also the dis distress they experienced in their interactions with doctors. And Sarah and I have just completed some work where we developed some resources for patients with chronic fatigue syndrome to help them work with GPs um, to help both understand their symptoms. And we've also developed an online learning for, for GPs to use with the Royal College of GP website. I've also more recently been working with patients and doctors around people who've got depression along with other long-term conditions. So this patient who's got depression, she was in a trial of a new intervention for depression with heart disease and diabetes, but she says, it's not something I talk to about with the GP. And this practice nurse was able to link depression and the physical symptoms, but talked to us about how difficult it was to tackle both at the same time. So ended up tackling them separately or not tackling the depression at all. And I wanted to present this. I know Ewan doesn't like my outfit in this, sorry. We won a um, RCGP Mental Health Paper of the Year with the work on people with depression and long-term conditions. And I need to mention 
Helen on the right there, who was an inspiration to all academic GPs and sadly died last year. We've also learned from patients that the doctor doesn't ask. So this is data from um, a study of people with psych uh, psoriasis. And this patient says, nobody's ever asked me. Even my GP has never said, how do you have to deal with that on a daily basis? How bad is it? Does it trouble you? And this presentation, which was actually done by Pauline Nelson at a conference last year, was recognised as very important work. And because Pauline had left, I had to go and meet Esther Ranson. So that's why this is here, because I met Esther Ranson. And in other work um, on people with chronic, women with chronic pelvic pain, again, the doctor doesn't listen. So this patient says, it's affected my personal life greatly. And he, the GP, doesn't seem to acknowledge this. And Linda McGowan, who's now a professor in Leeds, and I've done a lot of work around chronic pelvic pain, and we've recently evaluated a self-help guide for women with chronic pelvic pain, with the aim of women being able to work with their GP to understand the pain and to think about strategies to take them forward, to get rid of the chronicity. And Jo? I've worked with Jo to try and make the doctor listen. We wanted to, um, we were working on self-management for people with long-term conditions, and we wanted to provide the patient something to take into the consultation for them to highlight their problems, to prioritise their problems, mm -hmm. and to support agreement of a management plan. And so, Jo developed prisons. And Tom Blakeman who I was supervised, he was a PhD student. He did some work actually video recording consultations of people with long-term conditions. And he suggested that the biomedical, dealing with the disease, takes priority over the patient agenda around self-management. So I'm just going to present an extract. So the practice nurse says, are we still smoking? And then turns to the computer. And the patient says, God, you wanted me to stop smoking and drinking. And the practice nurse laughs. I'm only trying, as a professional, looks back at the screen, to advise you on the road to patient says, I know. And then the practice nurse completely changes the subject, looks at the computer and says, have you brought a urine sample in with you this morning? So a real missed opportunity in that consultation to support self-management. And this work fed into the WISE trial led by Anne Rogers, um, who's now in Southampton. And we wanted to try and improve the care of people with long-term conditions. So we used PRISMs to try to empower patients. We did develop some training for practices and for clinicians in practices to try and change primary care consultations. And we focused on the importance of support outside the practice for uh, GPs to ref and nurses to refer people to. And we developed some great guidebooks for people to use. We conducted a really big trial in Salford, and it was a completely negative trial. We did not improve patient care one bit. So we were all very disappointed, but we've learned lots of lessons. And some of those lessons I've taken uh, through to another programme grant where we're looking at the management of people with long-term conditions and comorbid depression. And Peter Salmon again and I have led the qualitative work, audio recording consultations. And just in the corner... Oh, is Else Guthrie, who is an academic psychiatrist in Manchester who needs to get a mention because I've worked with her for 20-odd years, both as a, an academic and as a psychiatrist GP. And I just want to present two sets of data from the Choice Project. So the GP in his interview talks about how he tries to motivate people, how he wants to see how motivated they are to make changes. But then... In the consultation, the GP says, any, any fresh or frozen fish is great, you know, it's fantastic. And the patient says, well, I, I love fish, but I, I can't afford it. And the GP cuts out that conversation and says, yeah, well, you know the test, so your liver, your kidney, your cholesterol's good. That was normal, and your blood, pressure, blood sugar's very good. So any discussion that could have been had about what the patient might want instead of fish, because he couldn't afford it, was lost. And three, we did some longitudinal work with this study and actually interviewed people three months down the line. 
and the patient still talks about the fish incident. He says, I mean, I like fish. I've got some in the fridge, but I don't make a point of buying it. It's too expensive. So those little encounters within the consultation have a dramatic impact on what patients do and what they think and how they behave in the future. And there's a lost opportunity in that consultation for discuss discussing with the patient about how they can change their lifestyle. And then the second case, the consultation first. So the patient who's just gone through a divorce, she's from a South Asian family, so she's had a hard time and she'd missed an appointment. And just before this extract, the nurse had told her off missing an appointment. And the patient says, I'm really, I'm really, I'm so good with my children and everything. So she's trying very hard to say to the nurse, you know, I might have missed my appointment, but I'm good at other things. And the nurse says, OK, so what I want to do first is, well, your symptoms, are they waking you up at night? So completely missed any discussion about the stress that the person was under. And the nurse in the interview said, she's quite an anxious lady. Sometimes she's got her own agenda about things. Or if they don't take priority. And the patient says, I was trying to say how stressed I'd been because of the things to do with my divorce, but it doesn't get engaged, doesn't get picked up on. And that nurse, when we interviewed her at three months, said, Do you know, I've been, that patient, when we interviewed her at three months, said, Well, I've been to see that nurse again. Do you know, and actually, I know what I can talk about. I can talk about my asthma. I can't talk about anything else that's going on in my life. So, looking forward, I want to say thank you to Christian, who's Professor of General Practice Research, for facilitating my move to Keele. And thank you to Val, head of the medical school, who encouraged me to apply for the post. And what am I bringing to Keele? And I know I've only got a couple of minutes. I've already said that pain and depression are associated, and I want to ensure that this link is prominent in my future work. So I want to focus on interventions to improve the health of older people and interventions for people with medically unexplained symptoms. I'm already working with Claire and Mark and Christian, trying to improve the management of people with long-term conditions who've got depression and com or comorbid anxiety and pain. I want to reduce distress in older people and mention pain and mood, but I've also had to learn about resilience um, and thank you very much to Ross and Jane and Bernadette for introducing me to this literature. It's been a steep learning, learning curve. And I've mentioned that I want to think about unexplained symptoms and managing people better. And I'm really pleased that we've just appointed a new chair of psychiatry who's come tonight, who's going to take this work forward with me. So thank you. And thank you to Andy for facilitating that appointment. Need to mention the MER trial. This is a trial, and I don't normally do drug trials because there's numbers in them. Um, but this is a trial of a, a second antidepressant for people who are not responding to one antidepressant. And I want to say thank you to Elaine Thomas, who leads the CTU here at Keele and who's facilitated the trial running smoothly. And then the guy on the right, oh, the guy on the right. It looks a bit sinister. He's actually fine. He's David Kessler, who's a psychiatrist down in Bristol and is the PI on the study. And the MER team, thank you, everybody, for making sure everything goes well. I've already mentioned that I really aim to increase research capacity, so mentoring and supporting medical students, supervising junior doctors and non-clinical researchers. So at this point, I want to mention the Academic Clinical Fellows, uh, Lizzie, Gwydion, Emma, Kay, Nav, Annabelle, and Kit, who, who've uh, been quite happy for me to, to work with them. And non-clinical researchers, Liz and Tom, thank you very much for uh, accepting me graciously onto your supervision team. Thank you to the social science team, Pauline, Bernadette, Jane, Tom, and Claire. Heather, who's also in the same room, and everybody else who's in the same room, and Roger Beach. Thank you very much for uh, embracing me and supporting me this last year. We've got a really active research user group at Keele. It's fantastic. And I need to say thank you to Adele and Carol, who have been splendid in sorting out discussion groups around depression in older people, about self-harm, which I haven't mentioned, <coughs> um, about chronic fatigue syndrome. 
way out of their normal area of expertise and comfort zone, I think. But thank you very much. And we have two fantastic research users who are working on the MERS study and working with us to analyse some data. So thank you to Elaine and Rianne um, for their ongoing support. And thank you to Anna and Ewan. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I obviously chose the wrong photograph because they really don't like this. But the reason I wanted to, to put this photograph up is because I really like the sun. I really like sitting reading in the sun with my family. And so when I'm not working, I'm, I, I have a life. I want to say thank you to Ewan because without him, this presentation would be worse than it is. He was responsible for all the screenshots that I still can't master. Um, and thank you to Anna for coming up from Bristol in your converse. <laughs> um, I'm very proud of you both. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Steve for his help, support and general organisational skills because without him um, I, I couldn't do what I do, so thank you. And lastly I want to say thank you to my sister Diane and to my brother-in-law John who have supported me all my life and I'm very grateful. So I've got a little something. And thank you for coming and thank you for listening. Thank you.